um, thank you for the introduction and uh, many thanks for the invitation to this uh, wonderful castle. So the title of my talk is What's the Difference uh, Quantifying Errors in uh, Human and Automatic Speech Recognition? And I'm kind of following uh, Odette's lead here um, on, this, on this topic. Uh, <laughs> all right, okay, let's do it like this. So I'm going to first start off with a um, motivation, which is, uh, from my point of view, uh, the, the auditory approach. So I'm, I'm from a research group in northwestern Germany, in Oldenburg, where, we do, where most people are concerned with uh, hearing research. So it's about uh, perceptual models, improving hearing aid algorithms. Uh, and so I'm more working on uh, uh, speech side, and so I try to capture this uh, general motivation with this logo here. So on the, on the far left side, you see uh, what's supposed to be a human ear, and you have an incoming sound signal. Um, I believe this is a, a, a sound pressure waveform of the uh, vowel O, and this is converted to some internal representation. I try to capture it with a spike train here which we try to convert to a digital representation and then, um, well, we process this with uh, automatic speech recognition algorithms. All right, and, and the um, general motivation is that, uh, is based on the observation that our auditory system is, is very good at is, uh, extracting the relevant cues for speech recognition, or that just mentioned that in most tasks, human listeners outperform uh, automatic speech recognizers. So, and, and the aim here is ultimately to improve uh, speech processing by considering principles of the human auditory system. So to identify the signal processing strategies that are really important in our hearing and kind of port that or, or bring that to uh, ASR. And one approach, and from, from my point of view, the, the, the fu fundamental uh, concept here is to first look at really the differences between humans and machines to actually identify, well, what, what do we need to improve here? Okay, so, so in the following, I'm gonna briefly introduce uh, two studies on man-machine comparison. So the first one is uh, on sublexical level with focus on uh, variability that's associated with speech itself. So speaking rate, speaking effort, for example. So these are speech intrinsic variability. Um, and the second one is on word level. Um, right, and I'm gonna use the word phoneme a lot, so uh, my, my apologies for that in advance. All right, so, okay, and the, the first part is gonna be uh, on sublexical level. Okay, so, so this is a very brief overview of, of what we uh, did. So we used uh, noisy nonsense utterances, uh, logotomes, which is Greek for uh, word slices, I, I believe. And we started off with these um, combinations of vowels, consonants and vowels, or the other way around, uh, consonant, vowel, and, and consonant. And we used these utterances and presented them to human listeners to uh, find out what's the human performance for this phoneme recognition task. Um, and secondly, we used these uh, same utterances and we converted them to ASR features, as you would do in a normal a ASR experiments and uh, use this for, as input for a trained ASR system. And uh, additionally, in this line of uh, experiments, we, we had the questions, oh yeah, okay, so, uh, so I, I have, to, have to say that by using nonsense utterances, we're not using at high, high level um, lexical knowledge, but we're laying the focus on sublexical um, level. Okay, and a question that we had in, in this research is, uh, is the information that is contained in the standard features uh, which are used as, as the input for the ASR system and which is what the ASR system has to build upon, is this sufficient for, for the best recognizer that we currently know, which are human listeners, uh, to recognize speech? And so uh, what we did was to, um, again, convert the utterances to uh, ASR features and then make those features in a step of resynthesis audible again and then use these resynthesized features, which sound kind of horrible if, you, if you're not adding uh, additional information, and provide those to human listeners, okay? 
uh, and the, the database that we've been using since at the time when we started those experiments, we didn't have a database that would have, would have been suitable for human and automatic speech recognition experiments at the same time, at least not on the sub-lexical level, which we were interested in. Um, so we recorded this database, which is the Oldenburg Logotum Corpus. So these are very simple uh, combinations, and on the right side here you see uh, a representation of what later listeners uh, would see in the experiments. This is a German transcript of uh, pop, pip, hop, and so on, poop, pip, and pop, and, and so this was uh, what listeners would hear, and, um, and they had to identify the, this, uh, one of those items. Uh, we recorded 150 different logotomes and invited 50 speakers. Um, and since we are especially interested in intrinsic variability, we asked the speakers uh, to vary the speaking rate, uh, the speaking effort, the speaking style, and we also visited uh, different places in Germany and also the French-speaking part in Belgium to record, uh, to, to capture dialect. So, so that was kind of enjoyable to do these recordings, and, uh, in these different parts. Oh yeah, and I should also advertise this uh, database. Uh, it's freely available at this address. Um, so uh, very briefly, I'm going to talk about how we actually resynthesized the features. Uh, and uh, so capsule coefficients, they uh, encode the spectral envelope of the short time Fourier transform. So, so, so you um, basically take take spectral slices from a spectrogram, and then this is what, what encoded, uh, is encoded by those. Um, and you could, in theory, just invert um, um, this, formula, uh, this formula to recalculate your uh, speech waveform from, from the capsule coefficients. But in this case, uh, we chose a, a machine learning approach. So we used a uh, linear neural net to uh, get back from the capsule coefficients to the spectral domain, right? So, so we found this was more stable. And, and, the, and the algorithm that we've been using for this was uh, provided by Chris de Moink, I'm not, so, which, was, which was, uh, was also mentioned by uh, Odette. So, so the problem is, so the problem is uh, when you do it like this, uh, you have a certain loss of information because these MFCCs are a compact representation of the speech sound uh, and they don't contain phase and fine structure. Um, but you need some fine structure to make these items audible again. And we did some pilot experiments and ended up with a uh, pulse strain <coughs> with fixed fundamental frequency. So it was better than noise excitation and um, so we, um, uh, right, and we found this without adding additional information to be uh, to be the best in that case. So these uh, signals they count uh, they, they sound kind of uh, artificial, like ada becomes ada and uh, udu becomes udu because we're not adding any additional information because we didn't want to give the human listeners any um, unfair advantage. Um, so this is how we performed the human listening experiments. Uh, again, one of the aims was to quantify the influence of speaking rate, style, and speaking effort. Uh, we didn't find participants who would be who were willing to listen to the 100,000 utterances from Olo. So uh, we selected utterances from four talkers and performed pilot experiments um, to get a 60 to 80 percent phoneme recognition rate. And as a masking noise. Uh, we chose a stationary noise with uh, speech uh, shape frequency characteristics. We invited six normal hearing subjects where the task for them was to identify the central phoneme uh, in these VCV and CVC utterances so that each subject listened to uh, two times uh, 3,600 utterances. The ASR experimental setup is pretty basic. So, of course, in, in this case, we use the, the basic features that we also use for the uh, resynthesis. Okay, so capsule coefficients with 13, uh, 13 components and uh, delta features. So, basic setup for ASR. Uh, also, the uh, classifier uh, we use um, standard approach, a hidden Markov uh, model. 
it was set up as a phoneme recognizer, which means um, just like the uh, listeners, the, the recognizers knew what phonemes were uh, out, outside of the, of the logotone. Okay. And the test data was, uh, of course, since this was kind of the point of those measurements, uh, the same as in the human speech recognition experiments. And uh, the training data consisted of six talkers without dialect. All right, and, and these are the, uh, the results here. What you see is the uh, phoneme error rate for the different conditions that we looked upon. Now, we only have one um, signal-to-noise ratio, once for the original sig uh, signals, which we chose to be minus 6 dB approximately, based on the pilot experiments, and one for the resynthesized, approximately 4, 4 dB. And then, of course, we ran a bunch of ASR experiments because these are cheap. Um, now, first thing uh, to note, if, if you consider uh, these word error rates here to be approximately the same, you can see that the human machine gap, um, or um, if, if you compare uh, ASR directly to HSR with the original signals, that ASR reaches human performance uh, only when the signal-to-noise ratio is increased by 15 dB, right? This is the difference between the minus 6 dB here and the plus 9 dB here. Uh, secondly, uh, we can see that the information loss due to feature extraction amounts, amounts to uh, 10 dB. So, so in this scenario, we, we see that MFCCs do not uh, contain all of the information rele uh, relevant for, for speech recognition. And we can also compare um, the scores obtained with the resynthesized signals with, the, um, with ASR. And so, uh, so from this, we can conclude for this phoneme recognition task that using the same information for human listeners, and uh, this should read ASR, uh, that there's still a gap of 5 dB, which can be associated with, uh, well, imperfect backends. Well, and uh, fourthly, this is a very common measure just to uh, talk about the, the increase. Um, see that uh, if, if you look at human scores at minus 6 dB and ASR at the same signal-to-noise ratio, then error rates are more than doubled. Okay. And so um, this is a slide on the int uh, influence of <laughs> intrinsic variation where we looked at the relative increase of error rates for, for humans and machines for the different speaking styles. And just one, very quickly, one uh, thing that we can see here is that um, you see that when you go from normal to fast speaking uh, style, this is a major problem for automatic speech recognizers. So this led us to the uh, idea that we should have a closer look on, on those uh, confusions, okay? Um, and now we're looking at the influence of the phoneme duration on recognition rates. So there's the phoneme duration on the x-axis and the error rate on the y-axis. Um, this is for human, uh, human speech recognition. Actually, I'm not going to go through all of this data, but just want to point out the, the general trend, OK? So you have uh, logotomes like fuff, fif, fif, fof, and fuff, so, so with a uh, it, which have this trend that the, with increasing phoneme duration, the error rate also rises. And the second trend is for the phonemes fa, fe, fi, fo, and foof, you have the, the opposite trend. Now we compare this to automatic speech recognition, right? And, and this is what we saw for, for speech recognition. And again, I'm not going to uh, talk you through all of these, but just say that for, for two examples, we found the same trend. Um, in other cases, no clear trend was observable, or even the opposite trend was found. So what we concluded from this was that for speech recognition, automatic speech recognition, the relation between phone, phoneme duration uh, and phone, oh, sorry, sorry about this, uh, between error rates and phoneme duration is less pronounced. Okay, okay, the relation between phoneme duration and phoneme duration is pretty pronounced in, in ASR, in all of the experiments that we looked at. And one possible solution is to integrate those cues on feature level. 
which is what we did, and it kind of helped, but this, is, this would be a different talk, so I'm, I'm not going to do that. So how much time do I have left? minutes. Okay. Okay, so, so the, the second part is shorter. So maybe I'll, I'll do it. The second part is about word recognition and comparing ASR and HSR on word recognition. We use uh, Aurora 2 for this, which is a framework for ASR experiments uh, that consists of noisy connected digits. Um, it is, although it has, uh, it was published around, uh, what was it, 98 or so, still among uh, the most often used corpora for ASR. And we use this uh, also in human listening experiments to find out how far have we come on closing the gap between man and machine. <coughs> so we invited uh, listeners, normal hearing listeners, um, to listen to a subset of Aurora 2. And we performed ASR experiments on the same data with uh, standard MFCC features and also auditory ASR features, which uh, have, have been developed in our lab. And we combined this for ASR, again, with a standard hidden Markov model backend. And uh, these are the results here. What you see here is the signal to noise ratio versus the word recognition error uh, accuracy. For this workshop, I should have converted this to uh, error rates, I guess. Um, but what you see is here in green, the human performance. And uh, in these blue tones, uh, there's automatic speech, speech, speech recognition for different training modes. <coughs> and the overall gap between humans and machines is at least 10 dB for this uh, recognizer that has not been touched in any way. So it's kind of a very basic ASR system. So, and this is the same data again. So you see, so here's the human performance at minus 10 dB and ASR performance uh, around 0 dB for the baseline. And then we check, we, we just plug our auditory features in there to find out how far have we come just, just using these auditory features, doing no backend modifications. And so you can see that the gap was kind of reduced by approximately 4 dB, but we still have some way to go. So we have some work, um, and that's, that's also not bad. I guess. So I guess I'm going to skip this part and just conclude. So by, by comparing resynthesized and original signals, um, at least for this phoneme recognition task, it appeared that standard features do not contain all information uh, relevant for speech recognition in noise. Uh, and secondly, the quantification of the task-dependent human machine gap showed that on phoneme level, uh, it's 15 dB in terms of the signal-to-noise ratio for the uh, phoneme set that we tested. And you can uh, kind of attribute 10 dB to feature extraction and 5 dB to the imperfect backend. Uh, on, on word level, it's uh, a bit smaller. So, so, so the gap here is 10 dB. And by using auditory features, um, this gap is kind of reduced from 10 dB to 6 dB, again, without uh, optimizing the backend. And lastly, uh, so intrinsic variability, uh, or the experiments regarding that show that automatic speech recognizers are especially sensitive against high speaking effort and a high speaking rate. Um, and this suggests to consider temporal cues more strongly than has been conventionally done in automatic speech recognition. Thanks to my colleagues from the medical physics group, and um, thanks to you for listening. I have a very quick question about um, the first results you showed us with the ori original speech and the resynthesized speech. And you had an increase in uh, uh, reduction in error rate for the resynthesized speech. Um, I, I did not understand that. Well, yes, uh, you're referring to the one with intrinsic variation, that one? No, no. no the, the this one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you go from 27 to 25, or don't I? Oh yeah, that's that's true. But at the same time, the signal to noise ratio was was varied. So so we ha had a hunch when we listened to the signals that these should be harder for human listeners, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so we wanted to pick one signal to noise ratio which uh, would result in average performance. And so we chose 
least kind of in advance. So, so this is a so this should be much easier since it's almost plus four dB, and this is minus six dB. Okay. It's noise dependent. It's it's task dependent. It's, it, so it depends on all sorts of things. So so I, I'm, I'm not making claims that this is a, a general thing for uh, stationary speech shaped. Uh, there were matched conditions. Which, so so the human listeners also had some training to adapt to these resynthesized stimuli. So, so we gave. So we thought it's fair to to have a matched training for ASR as well. Sorry, I, I didn't get the first part of the question. Uh, System that that should recognize speech in the open open wild, and uh, the system would also have to deal with uh, fewer observations. And also, I guess this will also be the case for human listeners. Uh, when you reduce the speech, then the, the temporal integration windows are, are smaller. Also. Um, so, so it's kind of true that, that uh, you could uh, look up this or uh, in, investigate this this difference. Yeah, it's it's true that that could also be 